Okay, let's run. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations. Welcome to And I Quote, the weekly show where we introduce you to content creators of all shapes and sizes that join us from many and all corners of the nerd universe. We find out more about them by taking your questions. I am your host, Ryan of Neuroculture, and our guest on this episode is someone we have been looking forward to having on this virtual set for a very, very long time. Please welcome indie artist and Superman fan extraordinaire, John Pinto, to the set. John, welcome. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, we're very thankful that you're with us. Now, if you have any questions for John Pinto as we go throughout the course of this episode, let us know in the comments, let us know in the chat. Our producers are going to be keeping an eye on it as we go throughout the course of this program. But in the meantime, John, how were you introduced to the world of comics? When did you start reading them? Oh, um, well, I have, I have an older brother, um, slightly older. He's not like, you know, 20 years older. He's only about 18 months. Uh, he, he started uh, reading comic books. And when my dad would, uh, go to, to the store on Sundays by the paper, he would buy us each a comic book also every Sunday morning. And I started looking at him before I knew how to read. I actually learned how to read in a comic book. Um, I, I, I even remember the, the story of the first comic book I ever read. So I was introduced very early into, into comic books and it's, hasn't stopped why goodness gracious well what would you say were some of your favorite comic book writers or artists past or present whoa uh it's a long list um and it changes over time the first artist i could remember um recognizing like i i could see a a a, a panel or a cover and go hey that that's so and so it was george perez when he was drawing the Fantastic Four, you know, he was still at Marvel before Teen Titans and everything. I mean, that's why I, I followed him over to the Teen Titans when he went to DC and he was doing the Justice League. Uh, then in quick succession, it was like the second golden age of comic books. So it was George Perez, it was John Byrne, Frank Miller, Walt Simonson, Howard Chaikin, uh, Bernie Wrightson, uh, you know, and the list goes on. Um, of course, you know, Steve Ditko, Jack Kirby, because I was getting the reprints of, of those works. And, uh, you know, everything's a huge influence. I mean, I was lucky enough to meet Kirby. Uh, didn't get to meet uh, Ditko, but um, hey, that's that's fine. I mean, I'm still being influenced. So it, it goes pretty far back. Writer, writer-wise, it was Mark Wolfman, Chris Claremont. Again, Walt Simonson, his wife, Louise Simonson. Um, I know I'm, I'm leaving more and more people out. Len Wein, uh, Roger Stern, um, probably wrote my favorite run on Spider-Man. Um, yeah, this there's probably a lot more writers I'm leaving out. Obviously, I'm kind of drawn to the pictures. No pun intended. Well, that's okay. I feel like you just named all the names that they would put on a Mount Rushmore of comic <laughs> book writers. And listen... That's that's not a problem. I mean, I just for the first time I read, I think it was last year. It was the crossover that they did way back when called Crisis on Infinite Earths. And I thought, that oh, was, yeah, I thought that was freaking amazing. And how you spoke of Howard Chaikin. I had the pleasure of not only meeting him, but I had him sign my uh, number one of Thrill Killer. Nice. Number one that he did. How with it. Yeah. Yeah. Howard's fun to talk to. He doesn't hold back. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, I, I was at his booth for a bit uh, at this convention. I'm trying to think of where it was. I think it was back at Galaxy Con in Richmond, Virginia, I want to say. Yeah. Was it Richmond? Yeah, it was. So I was there at Richmond, and I told him, you know, what was it like putting the story together for Throw Killer? And he says it was great. We had plans to do a, you know, a second part, a sequel, but they didn't, you know, the sales weren't there, and they just didn't want to do it. I'm like, really? That's a bummer, because I like Throw Killer. It was different. It was a bit grittier and darker and all that jazz. He's like... Yeah, but you know the higher ups didn't. <laughs> yeah, uh, grittier, darker. That's saying something for Howard because his stuff was always, you know, 
a little bit removed from mainstream, to say the least. Um, he's one of the guys I've met on more than one occasion, and when you're at a show, you know, sometimes I get to mill around before the show opens and stuff like that, and they can be a little bit more open to you talking, and, and so I, I got to meet Howard like that. He's one of the few artists I actually own some artwork from. So I own a couple of Buck Rogers sketches when he did Buck Rogers and, and a couple of my shadow pieces he did. Uh, uh. Mm, the shadow. The shadow knows. Yeah, it's one of my favorite all time. But that's probably my favorite pulp character when it comes to characters from way back when. That's definitely probably my favorite alongside the Phantom. or Yeah, the Phantom as well. Nice. The Phantom, that's a good one. Uh, among others, a lot of creative teams have taken on that character. So what would you say are some of your favorite comic book based movies or TV series past or present famous. All right. Hands down Superman, the movie 1978. <laughs> it's still the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I was uh, fortunate enough. I was the right age to see that when it came out in 78, I was nine years old. And um, I love telling this story. If you are familiar with the movie that I saw the movie in Hackensack, New Jersey. So no internet or, or things like that. There were no spoilers. So when he saves Hackensack in the movie, the, the audience went nuts. Probably the reaction there was different than any other theater. Uh, beyond that, uh, the Spider-Man movies, I waited a long time for those. Uh, I pretty much like all of them. Um, some are better than others, I'll admit. But, uh, but I, you know, if you put Spider-Man on the screen, I'm going to watch. Uh, X-Men movies, I, I kind of hunt and pack up those a little bit more. Um, I, I wish those followed the comic book timeline a little bit closer. I would have enjoyed that a little bit more, seeing the original uh, crew from the X-Men. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could pick a top five. That That's a that's a tough one for me, though. But if, if there's a comic book movie, I, I'm going to watch it. I mean, good or bad, I'm, I'm going to watch it. I've seen Green Lantern twice. So I mean, that says something. <laughs> oh, boy. Ooh. That was a bad day at the office for comic book movies. Yeah, and it's it's sad, too, because Martin Campbell's a great director, but there were too many cooks in that kitchen at the time. There were too many cooks. In yeah, the there was. And he's done a lot of other good movies, so I was holding out hope. But, you know, I mean, the guy only successfully rebooted uh, two, well... One franchise twice, and then he did it a third time with another franchise that I'll speak about in a minute here. But he rebooted James Bond twice Yep. with Pierce Brosnan's 1995's GoldenEye, one of the greatest action movies of all time. Anyone else who says otherwise, you're fooling yourself. And Casino Royale in 2006, yeah, which rebooted the franchise again with DC, with Daniel Craig killing it in that movie. By the way, the Casino Royale is so flipping good. Yes, it and, is. And then he did it even earlier than that with The Mask of Zorro. Another That's right. classic character. So, I mean, <laughs> Martin Campbell, you know yeah, a thing it, or two because you've it, done it, a thing or two. It, it makes me think he had a lot of interference on that. I, I think, you know, uh, big wigs and deep pockets start seeing numbers from other things and they think they know the answers. And, you know, there's a lot of notes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, that movie was bad. Anyhow, hey, we, but as far as picking the top five, I can understand how that could be extremely, extremely difficult considering how many comic book movies we have in today's landscape. And once again, we are here on And I Quote with our guest, John Pinto, here on the show. If you have any questions for him, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. If you are joining us live or on the replay, thank you for being here. And do not forget to like and share this with all of your closest friends. When did you decide to become an artist? Early on. Um, there was only two things I really liked to do, and that was uh, play baseball and draw pictures. Um, so I, I figured out pretty quickly I was not going to be a professional baseball player. Um, I, I also got hurt. So my, my knee my knee got hurt. Uh, fall weather up in the Northeast where I grew up was uh, I'm a, basically allergic to the Northeast in the fall. Uh, so that, that was going to be detrimental also. But um, – you know, I was one of those kids at school that was always drawing pictures in the margins. And in high school, I, I joked that I only passed high school Italian because of the portrait I drew of my Italian teacher in the back of my notebook, even though we didn't have art classes in my high school. So it, it, was, it was very early knowing that that's what I wanted to do. 
Um, there were other people in my family that drew and, and had aspirations. My dad was able to draw. My cousins were able to draw. My cousins are, are considerably older. But they were all talked out of it following it uh, as a vocation. And um, there was a little pushback. There was, there was worry, you know, make a living doing this uh, when, when it was, you know, my turn when I wanted to pursue it. And um, um, I, I just didn't listen. You know, because I'm stubborn. My mom said, you know, uh, that's, that's part of being a Taurus is I'm stubborn and a bullheaded. So I, I didn't listen to the pushback and I, I just proceeded to do what I felt like that was the only thing I could do. Uh, so it, it was an early decision. That's all I can do. That's all I know. That's all I love. Well, I shouldn't say that. My wife's in the other room. <laughs> that's all right. We won't tell her you said it. But, <laughs> but any, I mean, she'll find out on the replay later. But. <laughs> Despite that, well, <laughs> gee whiz. No, she, knows, she knows what I mean. It's okay. Okay. I was going to say, I'm not trying to start a domestic argument here, but what are some, <laughs> gee whiz, what are some of the rewards in your opinion about being an artist? When other people react to it, if there's a takeaway, you know, and uh, when I was still in art school, at senior year, you have a senior project and oddly enough, mine was movie posters. So I, I, I've been, yeah, I've, I've been putting putting a little bit into this for a while. And uh, I remember finalizing some of the pieces I did. And I remember which ones I did. I did um, The Lone Ranger. I did The Planet of the Apes. Um, the Six Million Dollar Man. And Doctor Who. But The Six Million Dollar Man one, I remember tightening that up. And it was almost done and bringing it with me. And there was another student my age or whatever and just just stopped as, as he walked into the studio and he's like oh john he goes he goes man that that takes me back he goes he goes that's awesome and and his reaction was you know it's what every artist wants wants to get you know from it you know if you you touch a an emotional response in somebody from your work that that's that's the reward you know if people want to look at it you know uh, that that's that's all we want is people to look at our work that's that's the end all be all there you go man there you go geez you mentioned planet of the apes uh, take your stinking <laughs> paws off me you dirty <laughs> ape. Anyway, it's a good movie it's one of the benchmarks of sci-fi so if you've never seen it with charlton heston if i'm not mistaken check it out it's a good yeah, film. very good movie you know i have a i have a story i used to have a planet of the apes piece and i remember some some guy walking and looking through my book i didn't know who he was i was in chicago and he stopped at the Planet of the Apes piece, and and he was serious. He was not pulling my leg. Turned to me and he said, "You know what? I never understood about this movie." He goes, "Why would the apes build a human-looking Statue of Liberty?" He totally did not get the end of the movie. One of the greatest endings of any movie, and he missed it. It's a good twist. <laughs> Don't you think it's a good? I think it's a good twist. It's a great I, twist. I think I, Rod I, the, Serling wrote that. Oh, that was Rod Serling. Okay. Man, that goes back a few decades. Granted, it was hmm, long before my time. But That's hey, okay. I watched it. I like Planet of the Apes. I just, as a matter of fact, I just bought the. Some, this came out years ago, so I'm not talking about the present. I'm talking about something that came out before that. They did a 35th anniversary remastered edition on DVD, and I got the two disc special edition uh, not too long ago from a. You know, place that's here uh, where I live here in North Carolina. It's called McKay's. If no one's ever heard of it, McKay's sells a bunch of Blu-ray, DVDs, vinyl, old school video game systems, basically anything retro. Like if you if you're a geek or a nerd like we are, they have something you're. <laughs> these are the droids you're looking for. So they had a two disc special edition. I'm like, well, I have Planet of the Apes on DVD, but the widescreen isn't remastered for 16 by 9 TV, so the, the box is very small. Like the right. Are, uh, I need to get this. And then I popped in and I'm like, great. Still has the black bars on it, but at least I still get to see the whole picture. Thank you. Mm. So I, don't worry. I got the right set. I didn't do it wrong. <laughs> so I'm just saying, if you're going to own something that's in a good format, Planet of the Apes is probably one of those films you should have in, in your set, respectively. But outside of that, flip side of the coin, what are some of the biggest challenges about being an artist? Uh, pleasing the customer. Uh, please, pl pleasing myself is, is, you know, that's usually your number one priority. But um, if there's a client involved, it's, it's pleasing the customer, pleasing the client. If someone else is writing the check, you know, they, they can tell you to make changes, whether you agree with it or not. And it's, you got to pick your battles of where you're going to stand your ground and say, no, I'm not changing that. Or, 
okay, I'm going to do it. Um, to me, that that's that's the the biggest hurdle, making sure that they're they're fine. I mean, there's always internal struggles. Um, uh, um, most of my followers are aware. I kind of like working in a lot of different styles. You know, I'll work in a retro style or the movie poster style. I, you know, a comic book style. And no matter what I'm working on personally, you know, it seems I get to a point where, oh man, I wish I was working that way right now and then it, it's always a push and pull there's so many artists out there that they have a, a look you know you know that's you see their piece and that's them and i always kind of wish I, I had that you know because my my mind is so schizophrenic style wise that i'm always jumping around and in art school i was always told um and i was warned and it was true that it's a double-edged sword you know, you think you could be this versatile artist and it, it could only be a benefit, but in many ways it's a detriment. As soon as it follows you or hires you for a particular look, that's all they know you for. And they'll go out and hire someone else, even though you can do the same work because they can't see past that's what your work looks like. And they put you in a box and my work's never been in a box and early in my career it, it was beneficial so i kind of let it go because i was working with a lot of licensed properties and i had to keep switching gears i had to make sure that they looked like you know the, the ip holders had the style guides for um and, and and it worked fine it's just a matter of when i can't turn off jumping around styles is is my personal struggle um the older I get, the easier I'm able to accept it. And I start enjoying it. So if I start working in one, I'm like, okay, or if I haven't worked in a certain style in a while, I'm like, all right, let's, let's get back into, into that cardboard box and play around with those toys for a little while. Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. So if you were to be uh, an Obi-Wan to someone's Luke Skywalker, there's a property right there. What pieces <laughs> of advice would you give to aspiring artists out there? I always say just learn the basics of drawing, learn the basics of art, no matter what you want to do, you have to learn what value is, uh, how shapes go together, um, perspective, you know, whether you want to do wild Ren and Stimpy looking cartoons or you want to paint um, photorealistic movie posters, you know, the principles are still going to be the principles of art. So learn the basics of drawing. Once you do that, then you see how it's applied to other things and it's always going to be applied to other things. Shapes will just change shape, but you still have to learn how to draw shapes, right? There's still light and shadow, there's form, there's texture. Um, when, once you have a grasp on those, then, then you can do anything, you know, but definitely learn the basics. Some great mic drop moments from our guest, John Pinto, on this episode of And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for John, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Whether you were joining this live or on the replay, thank you for being here. We really greatly appreciate that. Now, something I want to bring up here, uh, for those of you who may be watching or listening to this, these are some examples of the greatness that is John Pinto. And I'm just curious. What is the process like for putting some of these pieces together featuring <laughs> these characters? Because I see a nice little 31 flavors of Baskin Robbins here. Yeah, well, there you go. There, there's me jumping around in different styles. Uh, that's the banner for my like Facebook page and stuff like that. People are wondering. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, starting the Rocketeer, you know, Robin Hood. Um Man, I don't know. The Obi Wan is definitely a, a more of a cartoon take on it. The Superman is my uh, John Byrne homage to his Superman from the mid '80s, very much comic book style. I think I even have a newsprint texture on that. The uh, Indiana Jones, obviously, the Drew Struess and Richard Amsell inspired movie poster art. I mean, that one's much more of a painting. You know, um, the Rocketeer, even though it's more realistic, still has more of a um, a cartoon like cell shaded approach to it, as does Robin Hood, obviously, and Obi Wan. Um, and of course, you know, Spider Man is more of a comic book um, take there as well. I um, 
man, um, like like I said, that that's just me loving to jump around to different looks. You know, obviously with the Superman, the John Byrne, I was trying to emulate the way he he captured him. Robin Hood, I'm trying to stay on on style. Uh, Obi Wan is just my take, though. So that's that's just me drawing a, my character design version of you and McGregor. Um, they're all fun to do, though. I mean, drawing should be fun. Bottom line, it should be fun. It's frustrating for fun, fun. That's why I always say to my wife. When I get annoyed from working on my iPad or watching TV and I, I start grumbling or grousing because the line's not working right or the nose isn't right or whatever it is I'm painting or drawing. And, you know, it's she's like, you know, you need to put it down for a moment. It's like, no, I got, I got to solve this. I, I'm not going to sleep until I solve this problem. But, uh, you know, it's 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 good fun. It's frustrating fun. It, the, those are small hurdles to get over, right? And then you feel great once, once you're... Once you feel like you got it, I mean, sometimes you have to just let it go. The next one's always the best one. I always say I don't have a favorite. I always, I always say there's ten minutes where it's absolutely the best thing I can do, and then I start picking apart. Oh, I should have done that different. Should have done that different. And in the digital age, you know, you could always go back and fix things, but you have you have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. So once I put my name on it, that that's it. I'm not touching it again. It lives as it is. And hopefully, I, I remember what I did. Not necessarily wrong, but it's something I think I can improve on the next time I pick up the stylus or a pencil. Hmm. All right, all right. I see that. I like that. You jump jumping around different. It's it's almost like you're going from the inner rim to the mid rim, yeah. the outer rim, and whatever else is out there. Because you know, Star Trek and Star Wars. There's too many words, but <laughs> to describe what a galaxy or a universe is, because they all have different interpretations of that. Let's be perfectly honest. Oh my gosh, those properties have so many different terms. But that's that's really cool that you do different you do these different characters in these different styles. It gives people like different kind of options if they're looking for something at a convention. And that brings us to this. Have there been any special memories for you from being at conventions, whether you're there as a vendor or there as an attendee? Um, I haven't been at a lot of shows as an attendee. Uh, I, I like one or two uh, in the past 10, 12 years, maybe just small local ones. Otherwise, the special moments are, are what happens um, usually after the show closes or before the show opens, you know, um, if you're there, we're, we're milling about setting up our tables early in the morning, we bring in our coffee and I've had, um, most of my interactions with a lot of my idols, uh, then, um, meeting Howard Chaikin, um, I met Bernie Wrightson, uh, Geez, it must have been less than a year before he passed away. You know, he was just sitting there at his table, you know, drinking his coffee. I was walking past with mine, so I sat down. I got to talk to him for half an hour. Um, so, so, so many of the people I, I enjoyed reading their work or, or looking at their work um, when, when the camera is not on, so to speak, right? So the, they're, they're a little, they could be a little bit more open. When I was 15, okay, I grew up in New Jersey in the Northeast. Comic book conventions back then were much smaller affairs. They were still in ballrooms and hotels, right, at the, at the best. They weren't these grand circus-like spectacles in convention centers that they are now. So I would take the bus in. My friends and I would go in. And I, I decided I was bringing samples. So I drew three, four pages of comic book samples and I brought them with me and I showed people my samples and certain people have reputations of being um, very honest with their review of your work. And Neil Adams probably is at the top of that list, which I was blissfully unaware of. And I brought my samples and I showed them to Neil Adams. And he sat me down next to him. And for about half hour, 45 minutes, he was brutally honest with me <laughs> and set me on my way. <laughs> and sometimes it's rough to hear. But once you get past that, and you start thinking about what they actually told you. I mean, he was never mean about the work, right? He, he wasn't being mean for mean's sake. He was telling me what was wrong with the work. 
and what, once I could process that, you know, your 15 year little more guarded. This is my first real critique too. So this is before art school or anything like that too. So I wasn't really exposed to, to that type of back and forth either. Uh, I actually wasn't back and forth. He just piled it on. I didn't say anything. Years, years later, I'm in Indiana and I'm set up my booth and I went to uh, go get a cup of coffee and I'm walking back and there's Neil Adams just walking down the aisle way all by himself and he stopped in front of my booth and he just looked at the work and I see him nodding his head. And I just came up next to him and I said, good morning, Mr. Adams, how are you today? And he looked at me and he said, good morning. He goes, is this yours? I said, yes, it is. And he goes, this is very good. And he goes, I like this. And I guess, you know, I must have been grinning from, from ear to ear or past at that point. And then I, I told him the story of, the one I just told you when I was 15 and he was just nodding and smiling. And he just said, was I right? And I said, yeah, you were, you were right. He goes, that's, he goes, that's good. That's good to hear. He goes, when I do that, you always have two choices. You could either listen or you can quit. He goes, and obviously you didn't quit. And he goes, look at you now. And then we talked for a few more minutes. He went on and, uh, and then I joked to the to the guy sitting next to me. I said, "I'm never talking to Neil Adams again. I'm going out on a high note. He could be a little fickle sometimes. I don't want him to change his mind. I'm <laughs> leaving it like that." But so I feel like I've come full circle with that one. I figured I know I'm not the best artist out there, but I got a nod of approval from Neil Adams, so that's pretty good. Man, that's something. That's something. That's. Thank you for sharing that with us. That's a heck of a story, man. Coming full circle with all that, but you know, you get, you know, when you're young up and coming, don't, you know, you're, it's kind of, it's kind of like the old saying, like you're young, you're naive, you don't know how the world works. And then you get the, the critiques or the, the constructive criticism from one person who's been doing it forever. You take that feedback, right? You harness it, you use it, and then you put together your own work and it grows and grows and grows and it gets bigger and better as time goes on, of course, because people's skills develop over time. Yes. And you did it and everything came full circle. And you, and like you said, you went on on a high note with Neil Adams. That's dang. It's good. I like that. Right. It's a mic drop. It, it, I, I would venture to say so. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. That's whew, congrats on that, man. That's a uh, awesome sauce. If I ever heard one, I'm just saying, uh, gosh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Was, did Neil Adams contribute to Hard Traveling Heroes with Denny O'Neill? Was that him? Um, Is that Green well, Lantern and Green Arrow? Yes. Okay, so that was him. So I read that deluxe hardcover. That's a darn good storyline, Hard Traveling Heroes. That's pretty yeah, darn him, good. Yeah, him and Denny O'Neill. Of course, they're obviously linked with Green, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and, of course, revitalizing Batman after the the TV oh, yeah. show. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> – no problems with that. Uh, incredible stuff. And once again, we are here with John Pinto in this episode of And I Quote. If you have any questions for him, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Don't forget to like and share this episode with everyone you know. With that, I want to let you know that this episode of And I Quote in every episode is indeed powered by our good friends over there at Poddex. Now, Poddex are unique interview questions and episode starting prompts located in the palm of your very own hand. So whether you are a new podcaster or existing broadcaster looking to grow your audience or get more engagement you're going to want to check out our friends over there at poddex.com use code ryan10 that's r-y-a-n-1-0 ryan10 for 10 percent off your first order don't miss out on that one folks serious question though from our good friends at poddex here john do you count your steps <laughs> yes i walk every day <laughs> i do I walk three to five miles every day. So, yes, I do count my steps. There you go. Enough said. Ching. You know, what's the most awkward thing that happens to you on a regular basis? On a regular basis? Yeah, it could be anything. Could be anything. My, uh, I always find it amusing that my, my wife will see a picture and go, have you seen this? And I said, yeah, I drew that. So that happens more, more than, uh, you know, some people think I'm saying that, you know, being mean or whatever. I'm not being mean at all. I always find it funny. She finds it funny. Um, you know, it, to her, it, this is, you know, 
no, no one in my house fawns over what I do. I'm just dad. I'm just a husband. You know, it's my job. Um, they'll occasionally ask what I'm working on, but it's never over my shoulder looking at my stuff. So uh, they're, they're surprised sometimes. Um, but I, I really, so far, they, they haven't said something like, you know, oh boy, man, look, this sucks. <laughs> it's mine. So that hasn't happened. That'd be even more awkward. So I, I'm glad it tends to be more of the amusing awkward. There you go. Your artwork is too good to be bad. But at least in my opinion, as someone who's purchased a few of your prints, not that anyone's paying me to say this, but what's the funniest thing that you've seen a kid do? Any kid or like my son? Could be any kid. Could be someone you saw on the street. Could be someone walking down the, the neighborhood or one of your own children. Doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Uh, I always, I always like this story of, of my son is, uh, my, he's he's 19 now, but when he was younger, he's always been very book smart. When he was younger, we were rushing to get out of the house. Like we're going someplace where we're dressed up, right? We have shirts and ties on. My wife's getting ready, putting on a dress, so forth. And the dog has to go out. Joe, take out the dog. He opens up the front door. He said, I can't. The sprinklers are on. So I just looked at him and I'm like, there are other doors in this house. He's like, and like, you could see him working this through and suddenly it clicks like, oh yeah, there are. So he picks up the dog, he goes out a different door and he comes in a few minutes later, completely drenched. Like his clothes are transparent. He's so wet and I'm just like flabbergasted. I'm like, why are you so wet? What happened? He goes, I told you the sprinklers were on. I go, you could have turned left. And again, he had to stop and think it through. And it clicked in. He's like, oh, yeah, I could have. And he went outside and just walked right through a sprinkler because that's what he always did. Sprinklers. So I, I always find that amusing. So I don't know if anybody else does, but I always find that story amusing. I said, I would say it always illustrates Joe because he's brilliant, but he could do something so stupid like that he couldn't think of just turning the other direction away from the sprinkler. You know, you can always pull the John uh, Cusack movie line where his best friend looks at him and says, "Turn that way, really, or no, go that way, really fast." And if something gets in your way, turn. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if you remember, better off dead. I think it better, was called yeah. better off dead. Better off. If you remember that one, just if something gets in your way, turn. That's all you got to do. It's just turn. As, I believe the actor's name was Curtis Armstrong who, who said that line in the movie. If anyone knows who I'm talking about, more power to you. Curtis Armstrong. He was in Moon, Moonlighting, played uh, yeah. Bert Viola, and he was also what, Booger. Yeah, in, uh, Revenge of the Nerds. Yeah. Revenge of the Nerds, yeah. Yeah, there's, ooh, there's some throwbacks for you. What? Speaking of uh, comedies and hilarity, what's the funniest place you've ever fallen asleep? <laughs> uh, on an airplane? Okay, but I fell asleep before we took off. And then the stewardess had to wake me up, and I thought there was something wrong. I'm like, she's like, you have to get off the plane now. I'm like, oh, is there something wrong with the plane? Because we had landed, and I didn't know we took off and landed. I was asleep for like four or five hours, solid. So I didn't know we flew. That, that to me, was fun because it was like, you know, you blink your eyes and you're someplace else. Yeah, go from one place to the other, point A to point B, as they would say. What's, gee whiz, what's the, how do I put this? What is the dumbest way you've been injured? Dumbest way I've been injured? Or silliest. I cracked a rib coughing once in Atl crossing the street in Atlanta. I coughed so hard I actually cracked a rib. I didn't know it was possible to do something like that. Well, I'm here to tell you it is. Of course, I was there for a concert, and I was not about to go to the hospital, the doctor, until after the concert. So, oh my, who was playing that night? It was a reformed uh, one of my favorite bands out of Australia named Crowded House. Oh, okay. I'm not familiar with Crowded House, but wow. No, that's okay. They were okay. Wow was it was it a good, was it a good show? Like, did it end well, up being a good set? It was a, it was a great show. It was totally worth it. Oh. 
Okay. Well, as long as you had a good time at the show, I mean, I guess I had, a great, I had a great time. All right. All right. If someone wants to know more about this band, what's one or two songs that they should pop on the next time they're on YouTube? Their biggest hit was back in 1986. It's called Don't Dream It's Over. Don't Dream It's Over. Okay. Hmm. All right, I have to keep it. Have to have to keep a ear, keep an ear out for it, I guess, or keep an eye out for it. Because YouTube, you're like looking at stuff, but yes, yeah, sometimes it's just wallpaper, and then they play the song. You're right, uh, right. Or what do you call it? A, a freeze frame image, something yeah. like that. Album cover. Thank you. There it is. Yeah. Album cover. That's what they're called. Jeez, I got to remember my music terminology sometimes. <laughs> Whew. But I hope I don't have to. Uh, a good thing I don't have to keep on reminding myself of this. This has been a and I do mean this and seriously, this has been a spectacular episode of And I Quote with our guest, John Pinto. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. John, thank you for being here. This has been really good getting a chance to know you and hear more about the incredible stuff that you're doing. And speaking of that, where can the person watching or listening to this follow you on social media and keep up to date with all the incredible artwork you got going on? Uh, my website is www.johnpinto.com. Uh and then on Facebook and Instagram, it's Art of Pinto. And that's it. That's where I'm at. Fantastic. Thank you for being here. I do greatly appreciate it. My name is Ryan of Neuroculture. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at RyanRPM5. This has been a great episode of Ain't I Quote. We hope you've enjoyed it as well. We're, by the way, we're this close, this close to hitting 1,000 subscribers. Once we do, we're going to throw a great big live stream celebration that's going to have returning guests, some special guests. John Pinto maybe, maybe joining us on that stream. But hey, the only way we're going to be able to get to that point is if you tell your friends about us because they're going to tell their friends and they tell their friends and so on and so on and so on. You know how these things go. Indie supports Indie. That's what we do around here. Also, Power Rangers turns 30 on Monday night, August 28th, 8 p.m. EST. We're going to be celebrating it in grand, more phenomenal style. So we're going to have an incredible roster of panelists. We're going to be talking about our favorite moments, some of our favorite characters, some of our favorite toys that we collected when we were children or some of the action figures we may have in our collections now. I don't know. Maybe some posters that are hanging up on our walls. You know, who knows? But that's going to be a great celebration. It's going to be on Monday night, August the 28th, 8 p.m. EST. Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, all the social media channels. Uh, check them out. It's all going to be there. All the links to where you can follow John Pinto and myself are located within the description of this video. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Do all that stuff. Ring that bell so you get notified when our new videos go up or they go live. And remember, life is better when reading and supporting other independent creators. Take a look. Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida is leading the way in pop culture fun. From comic books and graphic novels to Funko Pops and collector's items, Famous Faces and Funnies has it all. Rick Shea and the professional team at Famous Faces and Funnies are friendly and knowledgeable. Whether you're looking for toys, props, collector treasures, or a new comic book, Famous Faces and Funnies is your one-stop shop. To find Famous Faces and Funnies on Facebook and Twitter, just type at FFF Comics. The summer of 1953, private investigator Will Lucky Marks was working as the in-house private eye for Arcane Pacific Pictures. Trapped inside the studio with the killer, Lucky must find the killer before time runs out. Lot 28. Own it today. Available iTunes and Amazon.com.
You've worked hard and written a great book. Now, it's time to give it a great cover. If you're an indie author or small press publisher, Plasma Fire Graphics is your source for affordable cover illustration and graphic design. Plasma Fire Graphics, when the look of your book matters to you. Good morning! Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. <laughs>